Great. So as we um, go on through these sessions from now on in, I'm going to make them less of a delivery and more of a conversation. Um, and particularly, I'm interested to hear from uh, those that um, are still sticking with us as to what their situation is, whether they're currently using Xero, whether they're using spreadsheets, what their plans are and everything else, and what their questions are uh, specifically, because clearly that will enable me to then customize the delivery to the needs. Um, and I can anticipate maybe another one or two sessions um, going forward, but potentially more, we'll just see how things go. Um, so, um, Today, what I'd like to do is to carry on with that fly for it through that we did in the last session on zero, but uh, bringing in some slightly more advanced concepts um, and features and functions. Um, but I'd like to start with a question that I had yesterday, which was um, about using multiple bank accounts and multiple companies. Uh, and how do you use that within the Xero program? Um, and Xero is designed um, as a subscription per company, in all honesty, or per business. So uh, if we could call that, rather than use the word company, if we could use the word business entity. Um, so um, if you had a limited company that owned a few properties, but you also owned properties in your personal name, then Zero really is designed in a way that you would have two separate zero accounts open. I'm just going to share my screen and explain and then show you that. Um, So, this is the company, the entity. And if I drop down there, I can change that and I can open another entity. It's slow to open. There it is. Okay. So, I have different entities set up in Xero and they're quite independent of each other. Zero doesn't recognize those entities at all in terms of connecting them. They're completely separate entities as far as Zero is concerned. Um, so um, if you had a sole trader that owned property, and if you had um, a limited company that owned property, then Zero would want you to use two separate accounts. So that will be two separate subscriptions. Zero do have um, a multiple account discounting structure. So um, you do have to pay for each entity that you set up on a monthly basis, but the monthly amount does reduce per um, as you get to a certain threshold. Um, so that's the situation with the entities. I do myself cheat their system a little bit using um, this feature that I'm going to show you again today, which I showed you last time, which is the tracking feature. Um, and actually within this entity here, this zero account here, I actually run um, two very small limit, separate limited companies. Um, and I also run my personal affairs, all of this particular, and I also run a guest house. So I've actually got four different entities running off here. Um, and I am basically making use of some of the features of Xero, like the tracking codes, in order to separate those different entities for my own purposes. But Xero is not designed to do that, and that's a little bit of a workaround hack, and it does have its limitations. So it's not something I would strongly recommend or teach you how to do, but just to let you know that it is possible uh, within one zero entity to actually operate more than one uh, uh, entity if you wanted to, but 
being mindful that um, uh, it's not really designed to do that and there will be uh, difficulties and limitations in doing that. Um, so this one here is my investment property company. So absolutely um, nice and clean, uh, one entity um, it has, and this was another question that came up, it has three bank accounts attached to it. So I am, all these three bank accounts I use exclusively for this company. Um, and therefore those bank accounts are shown there. So one of the questions was whether or not you can use multiple bank accounts within one zero company. And the answer is yes, you can have as many as you like. Um, there is then a further question being if you had a say a sole trader entity up here which was the property that you were uh, owning in your own personal name um, but you had all of the income and expenses for that going out of a personal bank account then how do you deal with that um, and uh, that's a, a case whereby you would have your personal bank account here but many of the transactions of your personal account bank account would not be relevant to that business, to that entity, okay? And I'm not gonna cover it now, but just to say that there are ways in which you can code those personal transactions, those non-business related transactions, and take them out of the equation, okay? So yes, you can do that, is the answer to that question. So I'm just gonna recap on um, the tracking, because this is a very important um, uh, feature for a property landlord or an investment portfolio um, because what this does is it splits your reports, it splits your profit and loss across different company, uh, sorry, across all your different properties. Um, and so um, I'm just going to show you how that would work. So you, you have here what's known as a tracking category. Okay, so if I wanted to add a new tracking category, then I can add the category name there. Okay, and then um, once you've set up the tracking category, you can then set up your um, category options, which in this case, so the tracking category is which property, and the category options are all of these properties. Okay, and when you get a new property, you just literally add another option here. So you can have numerous tracking categories and within each category, you have numerous tracking options. And then the way that that shows itself in Xero is that when you go to add either a bill or an invoice, um, you'll see an additional column that is shown in the invoice entry area. Okay, so this is my tracking category. Okay, here. And importantly, when you then look at your reports, if you look at your profit and loss account, um, find it. When you look at your profit and loss account, you can see that there are options within that where it will split the profit and loss account into the various tracking categories. In this case, it's from July 19 to May 20. You can choose your dates um, and you can see that it's, uh, you, you, so you choose your date range and you can see that you can then see a comparative of the whole profit and loss account spread across the traffic tracking categories. Now importantly, there's one at the end which is unassigned. So anything that you leave that tracking category blank when you're entering an invoice or entering a bill will then form, fall into the unassigned area. And that's something I need to check on a regular basis to make sure that I haven't accidentally left anything blank. Um, so I can see, for example, here you've got audit and accountancy fees here that is in the unassigned, which makes sense. I'm not going to assign 
um, audit or accountancy fees across all the properties, for example. Um, so, a quick, quick question, Rupert. Sorry, sorry to yeah, interrupt you. Uh, um, what's the best way to enable the tracking category in R zero? Is it through settings? So I'll just go back. So here we've got advanced, okay, accounting. So it's there's only five across the top accounting. Uh, sorry, yeah, and then. Here you've got tracking categories. It might just say advanced and you click advanced and then it'll come up. Okay. For me, it's, it's not coming up. So it sounds, sounds like I might have to go into settings and change change something to activate it. So do you have advanced come up? It's the yeah. advanced at the top, you know, third from the bottom. Have you, have you, clicked, have you clicked advanced first? Yeah, un under advanced, I only get chart of accounts and fixed assets, two options. Okay. You see the one at the top, Rupert, under accounting, the third uh, third from the top, advanced, that one. Okay. Do you get that? Tracking categories there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, okay, fine. Yep. So that takes you back to that. Okay. okay. All right. Good. Excellent. Well done. Um, so um, that basically is the tracking categories, and that's a really important part. And of course, um, if you're currently using Xero and you're now going to set these tracking categories up today, um, you may then want to consider, well, what, what about yesterday? What about the past? Um, and um, uh, you may want to look at when your year, your financial year started. Is it feasible to go back uh, to the beginning of your financial year to go through all the invoices and all the bills and then assign uh, them to the relevant tracking categories or are you just going to start it from uh, the beginning of next month for example so just something you need to bear in mind there um, in terms of setting up tracking categories but certainly once you've um, set them up and you take on a new property then it's very very easy to just add that tracking option into the category there the other thing i wanted to recap today um, which is of great importance when you're using zero uh, is the bank rules so um, within the bank you can either click on the three dots there without opening the bank account or you can open the bank account um, and then you can manage the account up here Okay. Um, incidentally, if your account does not feed, okay, directly into zero, and some bank accounts do not feed directly into zero, frustratingly, American Express stopped feeding directly into zero last month for some reason that they uh, emailed and told us about. But uh, so now we need to manually enter. Uh, the bank details, the American Express bank details into Xero. And we use this function here to do that, which is import a statement. And what Xero will do is it will give you a CSV file template. Um, you then need to download your bank statement into a CSV or an Excel file. Um, and then you need to format that statement into the um, template for zero if it doesn't automatically do that and then you can import the statement a little bit of messing around and to and froing the first time you do it um, but if you remember what you do um, then it's relatively straightforward to import a statement as far as that's concerned but i want to talk to you now about bank rules um, and uh, this is a really uh, powerful feature that you should, whenever you see something in the bank that you're reconciling, that you're going to be regularly reconciling that, then you should set up a bank rule. And you can see how many rules I've got here because this basically automates the bookkeeping for me. Um, and I've also got here receive money rules, okay? Um, and, and so on and so forth. And, and there is also here a transfer rule which would deal with um, transfers of money between one bank account and another bank account. So if there was regular transfers happening or every time you did a transfer, you um, 
put the same word in, specific word in, then you could set a rule up which automatically um, uh, recognize, zero would automatically recognize that. So it automates it. Okay. So um, I just want to, um, if we look at received money rules, you, th these are some of my tenants. Um, and if I take that first one there, this rule says, if the payee, so um, I'll, I'll come back to that later. If the payee contains that word, Monica, okay, then this is the name of the person, okay? And what I want you to do, Zero, is to do a, an entry, a journal entry, which says description is rental income, it goes into sales, there's no VAT, that's the tracking uh, option, the property there, okay? Um, then it gives you some more options if you want to have a reference set, okay? And then it says, which bank account shall I run that rule on? So I can run it on the rule that I know is the bank account that your tenant pays into, or if I wanted to, I can run it on all bank accounts, okay? Um, and then give it a title. Um, up here is really quite interesting, the conditions. So with the conditions, you've got equals, contain, start with, or blank, okay? And look, I can add another condition. So if I needed to, I could say if the, um, if the pay contains that word, okay, and um, the amount is greater than a hundred pounds, okay, then run the rule. Okay, now look here. If when the money received on the bank statement matches all of the following conditions. So in this case, it's an and between the two. So the payee must contain the word Monica. So the payee column, it could be any field contains the word Monica. If the payee in the bank statement column contains the word Monica, it may be that because she's in a, initiating that payment, it could be that she puts a different reference number each in each month. Therefore, I'm not saying equals Monica, because it could be that one month it says Monica one, two, three, and the next month it says Monica one, two, four. So we can take, if it contains Monica, it doesn't matter if what else it says. And the amount is greater than a hundred pounds because I know that Monica's rent is always going to be more than a hundred pounds. And sometimes she gives me 20 pounds for this, that, and the other. Um, then um, that is the only time, those conditions are the only time when it's going to run that rule. And, and, and Rupert, sorry. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, this is, this is a very powerful feature. Uh, yeah. Would this actually, uh, because, uh, every month what we tend to do is we go into zero and manually reconcile the transactions. So would this uh, reconcile the transactions if we set up a rule for receive yes. and spend? It wouldn't, it, it would not, yes and no. So I'm going to, I'm going to come on to that and I'm going to demonstrate that and illustrate okay. that for you. Sure. Okay. But it definitely makes life much, much quicker. Okay. It, um, here we've got the or function. Um, so, um, or at least, sorry, yes, the and and the or function. So th in this case, it only has to meet one of the conditions that you've written, you've written down, okay, in order for it to trigger the rule, because you've put any there. So this is a case where um, if one month Monica was paying the rent and the next month's uh, Monica's partner, um, Grant, was paying the rent, 
okay and there's so one month you had monica showing on the, as a payee and the next month you had grant showing as a payee you could actually then set up payee contains monica payee contains grant and have it as any of the following conditions so that's really important here whether you have all or whether you have any the other part that's really important that will uh, is do you want it to exactly equal okay for example the amount exactly equals that and only when the amount exactly equals that are we going to trigger the rule so this is really powerful but it does need some thought and consider consideration particularly in this section here okay because there are a lot of variables in this section and you will undoubtedly find situations where it's not triggered the rule and you look you're doing your reconciliation and you think i'm sure i set up a rule for that why is it not triggering the rule and the answer lies here because it's very very uh, intelligent and you've got to think like a computer and you've got to consider that but it's a very very powerful tool okay so um i'm just going to answer the question now um so i'm now going to go to the actually i'm going to go to this bank account where i can see that there's some reconciliation and hopefully there'll be a rule sitting in there somewhere okay here we are here um no that's not a rule i'm afraid no i don't have a rule to exemplify here but um basically um when there is let, let me just do that for you. What I'm going to do is unreconcile something in order so that you can see that. Okay, this one I know I have a rule for. Okay, so I'm going to remove the reconciliation for that one. And look, it's telling me that there's one to reconcile. And here it is. Okay. So the first thing it says here is, do you want to apply the rule? It gives the name of the rule. Okay. You can edit the rule directly from there, or you can not apply the rule. If it doesn't apply the rule, it will go back to match, and then you can just enter in your, um, or you can uh, enter it in in the normal way that you reconcile it. Okay, but when you know that that's correct to the rule, so you're having a look, okay, yeah, that's what I want. Yes, I want that rule to be enacted here. Then all you have to do is press okay. And that answers your question in terms of, does it automatically do it? Well, it does and it doesn't. It leaves you with that final click. Um, and sometimes you might find actually, no, that's not what I want. I don't want that rule to be triggered for whatever reason. Um, and um, uh, uh, it, it would be very unusual if I'm honest that you wouldn't want a rule to be ticked and unless you were very general in the way that you set your rule up in the first place and that then allowed more than one scenario to fall under that rule. Well, certainly I think some of, some of the expenses like uh, uh, if you have a HMO and if you have a fixed council tax going to a specific account every month or uh, something fixed going into every month that can potentially a rule trigger uh, automatically, right? So with council tax, let's look at these here. Um, uh, these are different um, British telecom bills for different properties, okay? My rule is it contains EM 2016-1895- no, sorry, not the dash, because that changes every month. So EM 2016-1895 is the account number. Every time British Telecom take a direct debit, they always put the account number in the PA, PAE column. And I know that if that account number there, it can only be for that property. So my rule is if, the PAE contains 
EN 2016-1895, then debit the uh, phone and internet accounts for that property. So when I go to reconcile, it shows me the rule and I just click OK. And then that one, I do exactly the same for, but it's going to a different property because it's a separate account number and I've set up a separate rule for that. Does that answer the question? Okay, I'll move on. Yes, sorry, I was uh, on mute, uh, but yeah, thanks very much, that answered the question. Yeah, good. Um, so really, really powerful, and, and this is in, in some, well, one of the many reasons why people who are using spreadsheets really ought to be considering moving on to using Zero because it speeds things up massively once you've got it all set up correctly. Um, not only does it speed things up, is it really does give you a lot more security of accuracy. Okay, once you know that you've got it set up correctly, yes, there's going to be um, teething problems because you may not have set it up correctly and you, you, over time you get to see where those problems lie. Um, and certainly one of my next sessions is going to be the month end routines and the controls, the, 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 the routine you go through to pick up on all of the main errors that are likely to happen during the course of the month. And that will be for another session. But um, the, uh, the, the key here is that once you've got it set up properly, you can just literally bang through 100, 200 transactions in the space of half an hour or so, um, just with a click. Yeah, that's correct, that's correct, that's correct. Um, so uh, that's uh, the bank rules. I want to come on to some common errors here now. And, and the reason I want to talk about the errors is not so much because we want to get too much in the depth of how to use zero on the individual things, but it, it, it's to help to um, utilize your background understanding of what's happening, the bookkeeping side of things in order to see this. And a common error in um, zero is that you will remember that I have said in the first session that you really have two choices in the way that you use zero, and most people will use them in both ways for different situations. So one way you can use zero is that when you get an invoice, you enter it as a bill. So from your dashboard, you, you enter your invoice that you've got either by um, email or in the post, you enter it as a new bill there, okay? And you then approve it, and if you want to, you can say that's been paid by that bank account, and you can say it's paid. You don't have to. Once it's approved, it's sitting there waiting to be reconciled in the bank. The other way you can use zero is that you can literally not enter any sales invoices, not enter any bills at all. And you can just wait until they hit the bank account. The limitation with that is that of course, if on the um, 30th of the month, you've got a pile of bills or invoices on your desk, okay, um, that have not influenced your bank account yet because they haven't been paid or they haven't come into your bank account, then your zero is not going to be up to the minute, up to the end of that month, because you're only entering transactions from the bank account. So the reason that we like to enter the invoices and the bills is to make sure that you're as up to date with your bookkeeping as you possibly can right up to the minute. Um, and the reality is, is that most people will have a combination of the, of the two. So what you'll be doing during the course of the month is you'll be entering your sales invoices, you'll be entering your bills, but then when you come to reconcile your bank account, you'll realize that there are entries in the bank account for which you have not already entered a bill or an invoice for, okay? Um, and because maybe the invoice was, was never given to you. Maybe it was a council tax, which was just a direct debit, 
So you don't get an invoice every month for that one. Um, and um, so then you just enter it directly from the bank account. So you've got two ways of posting it, journal entries in Zero. One is by entering the sales invoice or the bill. And when you, uh, ju just to be clear about important triggers in Zero, once you approve that bill, it's posted. So the cost that you put, the cost account there and the price that's put there will be affect, will affect your profit and loss account by that value. Okay, once you click approve. If you don't click approve, it will remain a draft and it won't affect it. But once you click to approve, that's in as far as that's concerned. Okay. Um, so um, then if you're doing your reconciliation of your bank account, um, and you come across um, an entry, here we are, a, a, a council tax bill, you might enter that directly in. So um, you might enter that directly in when you're doing the reconciliation because the whole of that bank account is currently reconciled. It's not easy for me to show that clearly as an example. Here we are. This is the reconciliation scheme. scheme. So Martin Prestige put two showers into a property the other week. Um, and um, I have entered his uh, bill as a bill in zero. So it's already posted as a bill in zero. Okay. Um, and actually, it looks like I haven't because if I had, it would be suggesting it there for me to match. If I click on match, actually it shows me what bills I have entered into zero that haven't been reconciled. And his isn't there. So in reality, um, it's not the case that I've entered a bill. Uh, but what if I had? Um, and what if I'd entered the bill as um, uh, PJ Plumbing, which was his business name, and what if I'd paid him £300 in advance and then £580 when he'd finished? Um, so I might have entered the bill um, a different value to the bank, but that particular bank account value. And therefore, um, when I'm doing this reconciliation um, here, zero can't actually match any of the bills that I have previously entered to that, okay? So it would leave it like that. So I can then go in there and I could say, okay, I know what that is, that's plumbing. That was the showers and that was in North Church Street. So I can enter it here, just like I enter a normal bill. And then I can click OK. The problem could arise that I had already entered the bill. OK, it would appear here in, in account transactions if I had already entered the bill. And it would appear as unreconciled. OK. So you could inadvertently enter a bill, post it, so it's hit your cost account, and then when you're doing your bank reconciliation, you could enter it again. So it's now double in your cost account, and that's an error. And that's a common error. That's something that will happen from time to time. You should be expectant of that to happen. Um, and there are ways in the month end routines and the controls that you do to actually pick up on these errors. Okay. Um, they're quite easy to pick up these errors, if I'm honest. So I wouldn't worry too much, but I just want to illustrate the effect of uh, some of the common errors and what they affect on the bookkeeping. Um, and if we do go into bills here, um, what you get in the bills is you can see every single bill, if you click there, that you've entered throughout history. Or you could look at the bills that you haven't yet reconciled with the bank or haven't yet marked as paid. Okay, 
So what would occur here is, and this would be one of your end of month routines, is you always go into your awaiting payment side of your bills to see what bills are showing in zero is not paid. And then you can double check that and you can say, hold on a minute, you know, I'm sure that that has been paid. Um, why wasn't it picked up when I did the bank reconciliation? And then you can see that you've actually directly entered it from the bank as well as entered it as a bill. And then, therefore, what you need to do is correct that. Okay, so that's one of the common errors of zero, which I thought I'd illustrate to you because it illustrates the understanding of what's happening in the background. The other thing that you need to be mindful of in zero, and we've spoken at length about the difference between the profit and loss account and the balance sheet, is that when you enter a bill, if you enter it as an asset account, um, it will not appear on the profit and loss. And I'm trying to think of a, an example of a mistake that could be made here. Best example I can think about is mortgage interest. So if you typed in interest there as a bill um, that you're paying to the bank, okay, and um, you inadvertently coded it to loan instead of coding it to interest. So you can see that interest is a four account, which in zero terms is your expenses account on uh, one of your expenses accounts on your profit and loss. Okay. Loan is uh, a balance sheet item. Okay. Where basically um, it's not a profit and loss account. It's not a trading item. Okay. So you could, if you had that 500 pounds of interest and you coded it to loan, okay, what it would actually think is that you're repaying the loan by 500 pounds. So your loan account on the balance sheet would be reduced by 500 pounds. And it would not show in your profit and loss. So when you come to the end of the month and you look at your profit and loss account and you look at it per property and you look across that line of interest, you say, that's strange. There's no interest. It seems that I'm really, really profitable in this property this month because there's no interest cost in there. But you've reconciled the bank account and everything's reconciled. So, you know, where is it? What's wrong there? And in this case, what you've done is you've coded it to a balance sheet item instead of coding it to the cost item. So you can inadvertently hide costs in the balance sheet if you misplace them from that. And again, there are controls at the end of the month, which I will go through in the next session, um, which can, if you go through the routine of controls, the vast majority of these errors will be automatically picked up by these different controls from that point of view. So those are two of the more common errors. Um, and I just want to show you this, the general ledger, okay? The general ledger will only show accounts that have been influenced in the date period that you have chosen for it. So I'm gonna go back um, to beginning of 2019 up till now okay and update that so this is all the accounts that have been influenced in that time period okay um, and so you can see here on the general ledger um, for example that loan account is there um, and there is an account here there are accounts you can use for example uh, one's called suspense, which is basically, it's a holding account that really ought to be zero at all times, okay? Um, but it can be a useful account if you want to 
um, if, for example, you're um, you're spending some money which has nothing to do with the business in one month, and you're getting that same amount of money back the next month, you really just don't want it involved in any of your reports or any of your accounts. So you might say, okay, well, look, I'm, I'm, I've got the entry in my uh, bank. I've got to reconcile it to something. I'm going to reconcile it to the suspense account. Okay. And then the following month, you know that money is going to come back from wherever. Um, and um, it comes back in. And then when you enter that into your bank reconciliation, then it cancels each other out, other out and the suspense account at the end of the second month is back to zero again. And again, this is part of your month end control. You can go to these liability accounts such as suspense and accruals and different um, accounts of that nature. And you just double check that whatever happens to be sitting in that account, you're happy that it's sitting there, okay? Um, you know why it's, it's there and you're controlling that account at the end of the month. Because if you've forgotten about it, okay, if you've entered one side of the equation into the suspense account and then when the money came back, you entered the receipt of the money into a, 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 a sales account, for example, um, then it would be showing on your sales um, and it would be wrongly stating that you've got you've, you've earned too much money. So there are liabilities accounts, and this general ledger is very, very useful because it goes through every singular account and it will show you every effect that you've had on each and individual accounts. So if I could choose one to, um, I don't know, broadband, it's a nice simple cost account there. Um, it's basically showing, and as you can see, you can show 200 items per page um, there. So it's basically showing every single entry that has influenced this account during that period of time. And if you want to drill down, you can drill down. So you can say, okay, um, what's that one? Okay, and it actually brings up the entry directly. So you can do a lot of what I might call forensic um, uh, work. If you're looking for errors, if you're dealing with something, you've got everything is at your disposal. And the general ledger is a very, very useful um, listing of all the accounts and every single um, influence that has been made on those accounts, every single journal entry that's happened at, during a period of time. Um, so quite useful if you just use the month at hand and you're just looking at the month at hand and you can then go through your general ledger and you can see the influence on it. No debit and credit. So just as an exercise when you're learning, you know, when you're not used to doing zero, at the end of the month, you know, put the whole month in, go to your general ledger um, and, and just play around, you know, just say, okay, um, Eclipse Wholesale, so, okay, that debited 104.40, so which account did it actually credit, you know, and you should be able to work that out. And then you could go into that account in the general ledger and see it on the other side as a credit. So you should be able to work out when you're using your general ledger, you know, if this one is clearly debiting the broadband account, okay, then what did it credit? Um, and ultimately, if it's in the bank, it will be crediting the bank account. So if you go into your bank account in general ledger, you'll see this figure in the bank account in general ledger as a credit, okay? So it's a really good uh, tool for problem solving, for seeing what's going on, but it's also not a bad learning tool. And it's quite good that you look at your general ledger at the end of each month for a short period. And then just, it's, it's very good for understanding what's going on in the background. I'm going to talk now, um, and this is the final subject uh, that I wanted to talk about today, uh, about fixed assets. And to do that, I'm going to change into Fair Clinics, which is our beauty business. Um, it's a trading business, it's VAT registered. Um, and um, 
I'm going to go into bill input um, here and um, I'm going to take an example where when we've inputted the purchase of a machine, we've used the account, which is an asset, a fixed asset account rather than a cost account. So we bought a machine and instead of saying that that's general expenses or something like that, um, we're going to say, no, that machine is a fixed asset. So we're going to code that to the asset account, plant and machinery. Okay. And I've just done that. So if we go into bills, I did this. I feel like one of those celebrity chefs. This is what I did earlier. Okay, this is it here. I'm going to avoid this bill at the end of this session. So it's just done as an example. Okay, and there it is. So on the 26th of May, we bought a machine. Um, the gross price was um, £8,000 because with that registered, the tax rate is 20%. So it's already calculated the net price there, the unit price of the machine. And it's, so it's um, uh, debited um, the unit price by 6666.67. And it's credited the, uh, sorry, it's also debited the VAT account by 1333.33. And it's credited accounts payable by 8,000. Okay. And um, so um, the account that we've put that to is plant and machinery. Now, introducing VAT here, it's the net amount that affects the, the account, whether it's a cost or, a, or an asset, it doesn't matter, it's the, the net amount. So whenever you look at your profit and loss account or any of your reports, the VAT is already taken out and put into the VAT account. So what you see is the real impact on your business as far as that's concerned. Um, but that's a, a side comment. The, the important comment I want to talk to you about is fixed assets, okay? And this is not showing on your profit and loss because you put it to an, a balance sheet account. You put it to your assets account, your fixed assets account, okay? So although 8,000 will have gone out of your bank account, 8,000, Negative is not showing on your profit and loss account in your performance of your business. So we go to fixed assets. This is something you do at the end of each month. And you can see in the fixed assets section, you have a draft, registered, sold and disposed column. And it automatically goes into draft because it knows that you've coded it to a fixed asset account it automatically assigns it a fixed asset number, okay? And your job is to look at that at the end of the month and saying, okay, do I want to register this as a fixed asset? Okay, the only reason you would not want to register it is that if it might be an error and it shouldn't have been coded to fixed assets in the first place, but yes, you need to register it, okay? And when you register it, you have the opportunity to put all sorts of different information in, such as a serial number, warranty expiry, what type, the type of asset is important. The reason that the type of asset is important is that, for example, computer equipment might fully depreciate in the year that you buy it. So that might be only one year's worth of depreciation, whereas furniture might be four years. Okay. Now, to a degree, you have a choice of how quickly or slowly you depreciate your assets. There are guidelines uh, and your accountant can help you with this, um, but the Inland Revenue or HMRC um, does not stipulate exactly the number of years you have to depreciate each asset for, but there are guidance and there are ranges. Okay, so furniture being depreciated for four years is perfectly acceptable plants and machinery being depreciated for two years is acceptable and four years is acceptable okay and it depends on your own how you want to um, uh, deal with your accounts in, in terms of how quickly or how slowly you decide to depreciate um, your uh, uh, fixed assets okay so in this case we would uh, Put it in as plant and machinery. Okay, um, that by the way, don't worry about that. That's just one of my tracking codes that I've set up. So it's showing there you put your description on, 
what date do you want this depreciation to start from? Okay, what type of depreciation do you want to use? Well, I'm not going to go into detail of that. I just use straight line, which is the normal. The effective life of that plant and machinery is four years. You can change it for that individual machine if you want to here. Okay, and then you register it. Okay. And once it's registered, which is not what I'm going to do in an example situation, okay, once it's registered, it's on the fixed asset register, okay? And you can see that um, with this, ten items per page, let's go down to 50 items per page. These are all the registered fixed assets. This is all the expenditure that we have had that we have not seen in our performance report, in our profit and loss. Okay, so a lot more has gone out of the bank account than is showing there. Um, and um, so if we look at this particular asset here, um, I think, I, so, this asset here, this computer, has a value, a book value left of only £19.50. Okay, because it was bought for £468.03 and we've dripped in um, a total so far of £448.53, leaving a book value of £19.50. And once that £19.50 is used up, it will have a zero value in the books it will be fully depreciated so that over time the whole of the cost of that has dripped itself into the profit and loss but over time and if you then look at the uh, profit and loss report here um, you can see in particular look at this year to date column here um, you can see the depreciation expense okay so four thousand pounds in total year to date has roughly one thousand three hundred pounds a month is being expensed and dripped in from those fixed assets into the performance of the business okay as those fixed assets get older more obsolete um, so the book value is reflecting the reality that one day they're going to need to be replaced again but it would be very wrong to say that if you spend £10,000 on a machine in May, that the performance of your business is £10,000 worse as a result, which is just not true, which is why we use fixed assets. And that's how Zero uses fixed assets. And it's so easy to do it. And then all you have to do is press this button here, run depreciation, and it will automatically feed the depreciation into your profit and loss account. You don't have to do any um, journals or anything like that. It's simply a case of just press run depreciation. So that's what I have on my list to talk about today. Um, I'm quite keen to sort of start to um, design future sessions based on your questions. Um, but the only other structured thing that I want to talk about in a future session um, is the month end routines. What do you do at the end of the month in order to ensure that you haven't made mistakes in the month um, and then feel confident that your profit and loss report and your balance sheet are accurate. Okay. Um, so any questions on that? If you want to unmute yourself with any questions, just press the space bar. Could you um, potentially put furniture and other things in your property business as a um, fixed asset? You should do. Um, if you were furnishing, you know, uh, an eight bed HMO, which meant you, you were spending sort of 15, well, I don't know, 12,000 pounds on furniture all in one go. Clearly your um, performance of your business isn't 12,000 pounds worse in that month. So what we're trying to do here is to separate the true performance of your business in your profit and loss for that month um, from those asset purchases. 
So what should happen is that 12,000 pounds should be put in as fixed assets, okay? Um, and then you should be dripping it through. With property, there are some certain different rules that need to be adopted in terms of depreciation. And I'm hesitating now before um, making a clear answer to that. So the first answer is you should be putting it into fixed assets. The answer as to how you apply that with regard to depreciation may differ from within a buy-to-let property. And I'm gonna come back to you with that answer because uh, a little alarm bell is going off in my mind at the moment into how you can apply that as a depreciation item in an investment property, which could be different to the rules that you can within a trading business that I've just shown you. So I'm gonna come back to you and uh, just clarify that point for you. But it definitely should go in as a fixed asset the question in my mind is whether or not you drip that into depreciation or not. So I'll come back to you on that. It could be that they want that to be part of the overall building cost, which is not depreciated. So I'll come back to you on that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Just another question, Rupert. Yeah. Uh, We've actually, we've changed uh, banks uh, for our property company from HSBC to Starling recently. And uh, uh, I think uh, by mistake, some of the tr uh, transactions have been reconciled in HSBC, which were supposed to be part of Starling. So is, is, it, is there a quick way to re uh, undo that? Is it remove and do we have to go through each transaction, remove and redo or can we do it, in, do it in bulk, in zero? Okay. I'd need to see exactly what you've done because what you've described isn't quite possible. But you can only reconcile directly from the bank account. So you can't reconcile something to HSBC if it's not in HSBC in the first place. I think what you may mean is that when you made the payment in the invoice, in, in the bill entry screen, screen you you applied the payment to the wrong bank account. Okay. Um, and then, therefore, um, it won't be showing when you go to reconcile it in, in, in the other bank account. Um, it will just be blank and you've got to re-enter it directly. And you won't be able to find it in the account transactions because you've told zero it's, it, it applies to a different bank account. Um, so if I could just share the screen once more. So we've got two bank accounts here. We've got Lloyd's RC Woodhouse and we've got Ned Bank RC Woodhouse. When we enter a bill, um, having finished entering the bill, um, and I'm going to have to approve it to make it work, uh, but that's okay. I can delete it later. Um, okay. When I enter the bill and approve the bill, it then says, have you paid the bill? So if you then said, yes, I've paid the bill. Okay. Where did you pay it from? And here I've got the choice of the different bank accounts. So I think what you're saying is that you have applied the wrong bank account there and it actually got paid by a different bank account. I think that's what you're saying. Um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, so I think my question was more around um, uh, the, the transactions. Uh, so by mistake, the bank account. Yeah, the HSBC transactions were incorrectly imported into the Star Starling account. Ah, in I, I'm, I'm with you. So you have manually imported them. They haven't fed Yeah, them. no, okay. no. Yeah, that's quite easy to deal with. 
actually. Um, so basically, you've manually imported into, um, I, I manually import all my transactions into this bank account here, okay? Because this particular bank does not have a feed. Okay, so if I, when I manually import transactions, what I then do is I, I every month do a balance check to the actual bank account, just to make sure that I'm controlling that, um, that we haven't missed any one transaction. Okay, so that's the first monthly control. Immediately after importing the data, I do that control. Okay, so I then go into the normal bank, internet banking, I check the balance as at the end of the month, I check this balance, and if there's a problem with that, then I know that I haven't imported every single line or I've double imported or something like that. But basically, if you've double imported, okay, then in statements, you literally just click the ones you don't want and click delete. And then you take those same entries. Um, if you were to then go to your internet banking, you create a new CSV file um, from your internet bank. You delete the items that you don't want and only leave the lines in that you do want. And then you import them again into your um, zero bank. And it doesn't matter that they might be earlier dates than the dates that have already been imported. Zero will sort them out into date order. Okay. Or oh, yeah, that, that's yeah. That's, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, good. Um, any other questions? So I'm going to come back to you and talk about um, the application of furniture in a buy -to -let property or an HMO, um, having told you that you definitely apply that to the fixed assets as furniture. Um, I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to come back to you about whether or not that should be a registered fixed asset with, with depreciation running or not. And I'm going to put the answer to that in the comments underneath this YouTube video, uh, just to clarify that point for anybody that's watching in the future. My gut feeling is that you don't depreciate um, furniture in a buy to let property, uh, but you definitely enter it in as a fixed asset. Um, good, any other questions before we close? Yeah. Um on this point, you talk about fixed assets like furniture, but uh, it's like uh, baths, screens, spotlights, things like that also is part of the, you know, overall furniture or, or not? At the, at the end of the day, uh, HMRC do give you an amount of flexibility in decision making here. And um, that ultimately, whatever you put into zero, your accountant is going to look at that at the end of the year and make a slightly parallel decision about these things to say that is it deductible or is it not deductible for tax purposes. So there might be things that you put into your profit and loss which are not deductible for tax purposes. Okay. What you're trying to do with zero is you're trying to illustrate the performance of your business for your own benefit, for your own financial control. Okay, and you've got to make that decision yourself. Um, some people might have their own rules to say that if the item is more than a hundred pounds or more than two hundred pounds, um, I'm going to apply it as a fixed asset, and if it's less, I'm going to put it into the performance. So, you know, this is really, you know, if you're going to be really strict, if you buy uh, some uh, a bottle of cleaning fluid. That's clearly a cost to the business. It's not something that is going to be kept in, in the um, house, okay? But strictly speaking, if you buy that vase, okay, that vase is still going to be there in a year's time if nobody breaks it. So strictly speaking, that vase is an asset. But do you really want to put 10 pounds worth of vase in as a fixed asset? You know, so you have to take a view. 
and generally speaking, the lower cost items um, you would put in as a cost to your business. And the larger physical higher cost items you put in as an asset. But if you bought 50 vases, you know, because of the size of your operation, you might choose, well, actually, you know, that's quite a big expense. I don't really want to see the cost of 50 vases showing in my profit and loss and reducing my profit because it is, um, uh, it's just not showing the true picture of profit. It's reducing the profit on my performance reports. And you, you might be using those reports to uh, show a bank uh, about your management accounts, you know, uh, because you're making uh, an application for lending. You may be wanting to bring a business partner into, into your uh, business and you want to be showing the true picture of your business and how well controlled, financially controlled it is. So these decisions have to be made by you based on how you want to illustrate the performance of your business. Strictly speaking, the vase is an asset, but you don't, no business puts every singular small item of expenditure where they're going to keep that item um, into assets. You know, there is certain amounts that you would just put completely in as cost because of its value. How do, does that help? Yeah, understood. Yeah. I have a second question is that sometimes uh, you pay with a different credit card uh, which is not attached or linked to the company and obviously not to QuickBooks or, or I have seen that you have done the same with the BT, so it's a direct debit through a Barclays bank of personal probably and then you link it there to your to the account or balances in the specific properties that you have in, in zero. Yeah. How, how do you do it when it's not direct debit? It's a one-off using a different credit card. In reality, you want to allocate it to, um, want to allocate it to your uh, director's uh, loan to that company. Yeah, so, how do you do so there are two ways of dealing with this. So we're dealing with, effectively, we're dealing with personal expenditure. Um, now, um, if you were working for an employer, which I'm sure you have done and you've done this, you've bought something with your own money um, from the supermarket for the purpose of business and you've, you've filled out an expense claim and the employer has then sent you the money that you've spent. Okay. Um, so if you are going to employ that same um, practice, then you will see that, and I haven't shown it to you up till now, mainly because generally as a self-employed person, you probably wouldn't, you know, as an owner manager, you probably wouldn't do this. Um, but if we go back and it's, can you hear me? Because the internet, sure. is, well, yeah, you can still hear me. So yeah. it's a bit slow, but within the dashboard, here it is. Um, expense claims. So you have got the ability to either invoice uh, a sales invoice, which will be your rent, a bill, which will be a bill you're paying from your bank account. Um, you could use the expense system, okay, to uh, deal with expenditure that you've made with a personal debit card at a different bank account or indeed a credit card that is personal that's not showing, where the bank account is not showing in these bank accounts, okay? If you were to use the expense system, then that's because you are going to actually recompense the bank account that was used, okay? So if you spent 100 pounds with a personal credit card, um, and then you decide that your business bank account is going to pay back, pay you back that hundred pounds and physically pay it back, then you use the expense system. And that operates very, it's very straightforward, very simple, and it's very, it, it operates exactly as you'd imagine it to operate when you're an employee. Um, 
when you're an over managed business okay you can use and this is something i'm going to go into in much more detail at the next session at a future session which you can use the director's loan account or you can use intercompany accounts okay um, and with the director's loan account you can set um, that up in such a way that um, when you pay the bill so you might put the bill in here but when you go to pay the bill you pay it from your director's loan account rather than your bank account Therefore, it won't be showing in these bank accounts to reconcile. It won't be showing as unreconciled. Where it will be showing is it will um, basically be um, reducing or in, uh, your, your director's loan account. So basically, by using personal money to buy something for the business, you are actually loaning the company money from your director's loan account and conversely by using your business account to buy some flowers which you're taking home and you're putting in your in your house okay you are basically doing the opposite you're basically using your you're influencing your director's loan account okay because the business is actually paying um, for those flowers upon your behalf. And it's the director's loan account that will be influenced on the balance sheet by those transactions. And I don't want to say a director's loan account is the same as a bank account, but you can actually conceptualize the director's loan account in a similar manner as conceptualizing a bank account. So, we have here a director's loan account, okay, and the transactions on that loan account could be literally all of those transactions that we talked about. You could have that the company is buying for your personal use, that you are personally using your bank account for um, buying company items. And then when you go to, you enter them into zero as if it's a normal purchase or whatever, but then you influence your director's loan account either way. And it will influence the amount of money that either you owe the company or the company owes you on your director's loan account. Okay. I'll come back to that another session. We'll start that from scratch uh, as if the question hasn't been answered so that we can build upon the understanding of the director's loan account. Any other questions? It's been very useful, Rupert, thank you. Okay. Great, okay, well, well. Did you set up everything yourself or you gave it to the accountant to set it up and then you took from there? But uh, to be honest, um, I was in the same boat as you. I had never used Xero before. Um, I subscribed to it. Um, my wife had, was a little bit ahead of me she started fab clinics up but both of us we literally just worked our way through from the start um, we used um, the zero tutorials the zero help function it's very good um, we asked the accountant on a couple of issues particularly to do with payroll and to do with VAT um, but the the workings of zero as I've described on these videos we pretty much just it was intuitive we just worked through um, a background in accounts and bookkeeping has helped me to do that. Um, I would say if you don't have that conceptual experience of bookkeeping, then you know you perhaps need a little bit more assistance just to get it up and running and get it started. Um, but um, you know, by all means, fire questions at me, and we can see if if it, if, it, if it's required that we need to take it, we need to give it to the accountant, give it to somebody else to get it up and running. It really depends on the complexity of it. Um, but uh, I'm sure between us we'll find an answer as to how to get you up and running. Thank you. Thanks, Rupert. 
Great, okay, we'll end that there. Um, I'll stick it up on the YouTube channel um, and um, uh, we'll do the next one on Friday at midday. Thank you okay. so much. Look forward to it. Catch yeah. you then. Great, thank Bye. you. Bye. See you.